So uh, Josh is a Seattle-based designer uh, who's worked in uh, agencies, uh, e-commerce, and academic libraries. And he, uh, he brought uh, to us a really provocative question that a lot of IAs are going to have to wrestle with at some point in their careers, which is uh, when there's a conflict between what the customer wants and what the e-commerce retailer wants, how do we stay true to our principles? Um, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say about that as soon as I find your slide deck. All right. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Give it up for Josh. Thanks. Thank you, man. Okay, so uh, you can see already it's a little bit of a different title than you saw in your program and you know, what is e-commerce really if uh, there's not a little bit of bait and switch there? So uh, just like every single ad or link that invites you to click to learn that one weird trick to lose belly fat or lower your mortgage, I have no intention of delivering on this statement. <laughs> Okay, disclaimer, I just want to tell you a little bit more about where I'm coming from so you can be more informed about the, uh, what I'm going to tell you. Uh, I did not and uh, do not work at Amazon. Uh, I worked at an agency that for the past three years that uh, made e-commerce websites largely for brands. So Fender guitars, Seize candies. Uh, Leatherman Tools, uh, and some of the smaller brands like Safari Land or Kiko, very big in their spaces. Um, usually for brands and a handful of aggregate retailers as well. Anybody here from Canada? Really? No Canadians? All right, we got one Canadian. All right, so nobody knows what I mean by the significant Canadian retailer named London Drugs that I did a lot of work for, but oh well. Okay. So why did I get into this racket? I started out in libraries, uh, an idealistic young buck, moved into the private sector so I could one day have a mortgage. Uh, my life goals in engaging with uh, user experience in the private sector really is, is right up there on the screen. Advocate for the user in a design process. So be the ombudsman for the user. And I know there's a lot of people different, uh, here from different crafts, have different experiences, different um, levels of experience even. Uh, but it's always important to remember that this is something that you can bring to the table if you are sufficiently empowered to do so. When I got in here today, I was talking with Andrew Morton, and uh, he told me about uh, a, a problem they were having at their office. Don't worry, I won't out you. <laughs> Uh, but he was talking about a challenge they were having, a design challenge they were having at their office around uh, how they should implement a certain UI feature. And I gave him my unsolicited opinion. I said, well, in best practices. <laughs> Andrew uh, winced a little bit and said, yeah, that would be great if um, you know, we had an extra 100 hours of dev time, right? So already uh, my colleague Andrew Morton is tainted by his job role. He is no longer an advocate for the user, he's an advocate for uh, the development process. Now that's not uh, to say anything against Andy, uh, but it is uh, equally true for you uh, if you come into a process as the user-centered designer, you've got something already that the other folks don't have, which is you don't have a vested interest in staying on budget uh, like a uh, project manager would, or making the most money like the MBA in the room has to, um, or uh, realizing your failed arts career like the visual designer. Um, So anyway, yeah, uh, you know, just generally speaking, you want to connect people with uh, the information they need, slash want, you know? What, what could be better? Uh, speaking more generally about what we do in the field of UX as it intersects with e-commerce, and this isn't, of course, limited to that, but there's sort of three things you want to keep in mind. You want to instill trust. So we just met you, you just wandered in off of a search engine, and you come to the site. Uh, we want you to feel like we're going to handle your credit card data uh, securely. 
uh, and even maybe uh, feel comfortable enough with us to create an account, leave some reviews, that sort of thing. Support decision making, so uh, unless you're a website that sells a singular product, people will always have to make choices, uh, parse uh, parse products and eventually maybe even parse things like shipping method or um, gift messaging. So for all those things we want to provide the amount of information people need just in time to make that choice and then get out of town before we cloud their minds. Uh, and then we want to provide a clear path to completion, right? So this usually means uh, conversion, this usually means uh, helping the person check out, finding the product they want. Uh, identifying it, having enough confidence in it for them to check out. But this could involve other things uh, that are important to businesses in the e-commerce space like creating accounts or uh, even connecting with content. We've had clients that cared very little for actually uh, people buying things off the website. They just wanted them to connect with articles or photography on the website and then go buy it in the store. So usually provide a clear path to completion means conversion but not necessarily. All right. So that's what you think your job is when somebody hires you to be a user experience designer in the e-commerce field. Uh, but then there's this stuff, right? So uh, here's the part that nobody ever tells you, uh, certainly not standing up in front of a uh, camera and number of nice handsome faces here. Uh, it's not user-centered design in the strictest sense, right? So uh, somebody's paying you to do this. Yes, this is true probably for any design project, unless you work at a charity or something like that, uh, that you uh, have to incorporate business needs and business goals into your work. Uh, but perhaps in the e-commerce space this is more significant than say if I was designing the next version of Photoshop or Xbox UI, right? So for something like that I might be able to say what does the engineering and time frame allow me to accomplish and otherwise I'm just going to give the users what they want. But uh, in this case we have to listen to people who hired us and uh, are have a uh, different motivation in providing users with exactly what they want. Um, you know, it, in as much as we say that we want to be user-centered designers, I mean, there's a logical, there's a logical challenge there, right? So, if I was really a user-centered designer, I would tell you everything that was wrong with our products. I would tell you where you could get better prices elsewhere and the actually better products you could find elsewhere. I wouldn't obtrusively uh, advertise to you uh, whenever I could. Uh, I wouldn't try and upsell you, and I would just give you the products for free. Just give me your address. <laughs> uh, right, so that, that runs up against a, a challenge there, but nevertheless, there's this uh, constant uh, knife edge that you're walking uh, between serving the business and use, uh, serving the user, and ensuring that we keep that uh, point on the horizon as the user and not uh, other things is important. Uh, and then there's this other thing. I also get points for distracting you. Now, strictly speaking, uh, if I wanted to uh, be a pure user-centered designer, uh, I wouldn't try and upsell you or perhaps do things like this. Now, this is everybody's favorite e-commerce experience, right? You come to the website, before you even get to read a word of the page, they want you to sign up for emails, right? <laughs> Terrific UX experience. I, uh, would like to tell you uh, I have never designed a wireframe for an email sign-up that pops up for you uh, as soon as you land on the page. Alas, I have created numerous ones uh, and they're all to best practices, I assure you. Uh, <laughs> but I do tell people that uh, genuine best practices would wait until people were enthusiastic about your brand and they have found products they want to connect with and they would be more likely to divulge their personal information instead of coming off like the guy in the singles bar that you know uh, makes eye contact and immediately asks where do you live <laughs> um, I, I mean, I find this like the greatest of irony, right? Like if you ever wanted to get back to this thing, you can't, right? Let's say like later you wanted to sign up for email. Like it's gone. You only got it the first time you came to the website and then it was over. You missed your chance, right? Um, so I always tell people, you know, it's better dovetailed into other experiences, but alas, there it is. Um, these came in my mail yesterday and I'm guessing just uh, on the fact that most of you people are younger than 80, uh, this is the first time you've seen the inside of a mail flyer uh, since 1998. Um, unless you line 
bird cages or something. But uh, one of the most remarkable things is, is that uh, not only do these things come in the mail and somebody's paying to have them printed and mailed to your house, but I work for clients uh, that proudly uh, show the link to a PDF version of their mailer uh, right off the header there. And <laughs> nothing could talk them out of it. Why? Well, alas, it still works, even though it's completely divorced from the e-commerce experience, right? So a PDF, you can't click on that and go you know, check out anything like that. You can't turn the product around or see other views of it. It's a completely uh, print version of what should be a PDP representation, of so a product detail page representation of something, right? Uh, but alas, there they are. And then, of course, one of my favorites. Can you read that? Yeah. So yes, I did buy baking soda last night. And uh, I guess you'll just have to check my Twitter account and find out if I <laughs> told the world. Um, so there this is on a certain major retailer that happens to call our city home. And uh, it doesn't matter what you buy, um, even if it's some you know, naughty video cassettes or something, I don't know. Uh, but there you are, always given the opportunity to share, um, share what you've just bought at the, at the finish line of having uh, completed your checkout, right? So, one of the things I, f I think I find so challenging about this is that uh, these are all ideas that are here because they're already here. And nobody would ever invent these systems if they started afresh. Uh, but because they've got momentum, uh, people are reticent to change. And of course, uh, especially coming in as part of an agency, uh, you've got a real uphill battle to affect change in an organization because you've got no rapport with people, assuming you just started with them. Uh, and most of the time in my work, uh, I would come in and I met them as soon as they wanted to kick off this project and we waved goodbye as soon as we finished the website and that was it. So it wasn't an ongoing retainer business. Uh, so, I mean, there's lots of reasons to resist change. Um, unfortunately, none of them are, are good. I mean, you could have people that hate it because um, as soon as they uh, incorporate the change that you're asking for, they feel that their job would be irrelevant or they'll tell you that people over 60 still buy things in the case of flyers or something like that. Um, but uh, uh, finishing with that though, I want to start talking about some of the major tasks that we have to solve on a regular basis in e-commerce. Where they stand today, uh, why that's so disappointing to me, and where I think they should move. Uh, if Joshua D. Walker was king of the world. Okay, so navigation, because, uh, hey, we're all IAs right here, yeah? Raise your hand if you call yourself an IA. Okay, <laughs> Stuart. <laughs> At least the guy who organized it is an IA, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm very passionate about information architecture, and, and I have to admit that uh, besides deciding whether a skirt is a skirt or shorts, I don't often have to make uh, those sorts of choices about taxonomy very often. Um, but in any case, so uh, navigation is, is one of the things I'm very passionate about. Again, connecting people with product and finding a way to do it. I'll just start you off with, not anybody I ever worked for, but this is... Um, I'm sure another major retailer you recognize, and even if you don't, it's, the, it's how everybody looks these days, right? So you've got this hamburger nav, as we call it, in the upper right-hand corner there. You click on that, you get a monstrous list, and from there you have these big fly-outs as you roll down the gray buttons, right? So this breaks all sorts of rules. If you've ever taken a basic uh, class on, on how to uh, design for human minds, for example, uh, keep your labels succinct, uh, never make people choose between more than three things. I'm sure you've heard that chestnut about choice freeze, right? So why is this not only designed poorly, but the world's most popular navigation structure? Not rhetorical. Come on. <laughs> what do you guys think? Pop quiz. It's already done. It's already done. Okay. Everyone thinks so. So you could have different business stakeholders advocating for their category being promoted, right? Oh, that's a good one. That's like a real IA reason. Yeah. Okay. 
shows the scope and breadth of the products on offer, which is definitely something we factor in when we make navigation structures. Any other ones? Ah, it's got familiarity. So we've lowered the cognitive load for users by using a system that they already know. Also a very good reason for using a system, right? Uh, unfortunately, this uh, degenerate piece of trash has nothing to do with our discipline. And that's why, the way, uh, that's why it is the way it is. So the reason why you say sports fitness outdoors instead of just saying sports or beauty health pharmacy instead of just saying pharmacy, et cetera, this is all for SEO. So Google rewards you for having things in your navigation structure. You take things out of your navigation structure, your rankings fall. So here we've got a system that completely services Google at the expense of human beings. Uh, I wish I could tell you that this wasn't one of my clients, but this is a, uh, a local sportswear company that I talked to at great length and with great failure. Uh, to change what they were doing, and at least I got them to put in two levels of information. I'm getting a five minute warning already. All right, uh, so um, I'll show you what I did do, though, for somebody who said that search was not important for them. So this is Fender Guitars. When I first met Fender Guitars, you came to their navigation structure and they asked you which series you wanted to buy in. Did you want an Excelsior or did you want a Mark II? Did you want a, a, a Meadowlark? Uh, these were the things that you're asking you to choose between. And of course, even the most fanatical guitarist doesn't even know what those things mean. So what I suggested is, is that you have a top level structure of terms that don't need any reinforcement at all. They're simple and they're comprehensible for anybody without any additional information. Uh, guitars, bass, amp, studio, culture. And you'll notice that guitars does not describe this category uh, in its entirety, there's things that don't, strictly speaking, meet the definition of guitar. But this is often the mistake people make, is that category labels don't have to be exhaustive. They just have to be the best of the choices for the user to uh, sniff for that information there. I had an exhaustive, uh, <laughs> exhausting conversation with somebody at Leatherman Tools because they said, uh, I, I gave them a navigation structure that had two items in it, tools, accessories. Uh, and they argued with me we needed to have tools, knives, accessories, because knives were not tools. And I didn't even want to get all archaeological on them and tell them that maybe <laughs> knives were perhaps one of the first tools humans ever invented. <laughs> Putting that aside, if you went to the website and you had two choices, tools, accessories, where are folks going to look for the knives? <laughs> um, so this is very much based on that. Like, is a banjo a guitar? Strictly speaking, no. But if you're given a choice between basses and amps, you're probably going to look on the guitar. OK. Here's another local retailer um, that some people here might even work for. Uh, this is where I think we're moving more towards. This is actually a drop-down navigation, even though it's such a full screen takeover. It looks like more. Um, what you see, though, is a giant invitation to connect with a more hub-like experience where you're going to see product blended with content, uh, followed by three promoted elements here, expert advice classes, REI adventures, uh, before they unleash the mega nav because they don't want to lose their SEO. So if we go back to something like this, I think that it's not going away anytime soon until Google changes their rules. Uh, but I did want to show you at least what I envision the future could look like uh, in a really user-centered design because we've already run out of room in the mega nav for displaying all the product categories and the product subcategories. Uh, this is something I designed for uh, a lovely retailer uh, that offers an eccentric offering of products. So at the top level of navigation here we've got electronics, beauty, home, health, and seasonal offering. Inside uh, the electronics category though, I didn't want to show them every single exhaustive category. And I also wanted them to understand that some categories are a specialization of this retailer. Camera, computers, TV, and audio. We do have other categories, but let's just talk about something at a comprehensible human level. Um, well, I do have uh, quite a bit more to go through, but I've already hit my, uh, my time, so uh, love to check in with you later, but let me just ask you if there's any questions on, on what I have so far. Okay, I'll talk about this one a little bit more then because you don't have any questions. So 
over here you've got the desktop experience and over here you've got the mobile experience. And of course, the question is always asked, but what about that category? Why isn't that category up there? Or we really have eight top categories uh, in electronics, not just three. And of course, you can go through these discussions over and over again. It is a proven scientific principle, and I can tell you I worked on an analytics project that said as much, that once human brains see more than three things in a list, their engagement with the whole list decays. And once you hit five, you've really reached their maximum. Uh, and once you move into six, it's over. Right? They're just going to skip over the list as TLDR. So really your optimum is three, four, or five items that you want to present people in any sort of point in the decision tree. And that's what I was trying to create here while also creating uh, priority so that we could have three categories. And I'm sorry, but yes, you do have to pick three. I know you think there's eight. Uh, but that's just how the world works. Just because you have more products doesn't mean our brains suddenly got bigger. Uh, so we've got three major categories and then we can uh, engage deeper with a longer list of categories and I'll give you a featured set of subcategories over in the middle there uh, as deference to our comrades over in SEO who say that we absolutely have to mention that we've got SLR cameras. It's not enough just to put the parent category cameras up there. And then finally, we want to have a large visual item, much like we do uh, over at REI, where we're going to engage people with a bit of contents that's graphic and visual. But in the mobile version, we are unabashedly uh, promoting search as the primary way of engaging with this massive 80,000 item catalog. Uh, and we're only offering those hubs uh, after search is over. So yeah, I did have quite a bit more to talk about, but uh, I really appreciate your attention, guys, and uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>